Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. If you're in the neighborhood, like to come on by before you head out to work, school, or to do some shopping. We'd love to have you here at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Today, we will be in the book of 2 Corinthians. Yeah, we're moving ahead and we're hitting the second letter to the Corinthians by the Apostle Paul. Let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to bless our message. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, Lord, this morning, seeking your wisdom and your guidance as you minister to all of us, Lord God, your truth. We pray that we would be open to hear what you would have to say, Father, that we may be equipped for the work that you have called us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God I'll bless you, you Gary. God we'll see you later. Okay. All right, 1 Corinthians. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians. We're in chapter 1. Uh, we concluded chapter 1, uh, which was a very good chapter, as Paul was dealing with various issues in the church of carnality. And in chapter 2, I'm sorry, in, cha in 2 Corinthians, Paul is now dealing with apparently some false uh, prophets or apostles uh, that have come to the church pretending to be apostles and trying to take the place of the apostle Paul. And Paul is warning the church to be careful not to believe uh, all men. They need to have their credentials. So I guess we can uh, apply a warning here for us, and that is to be careful who is teaching you that you are reading the Word of God and that you are studying and showing yourself approved by God as uh, you read through the Scriptures so that you can test all things, and that includes everyone that that is teaching the Word of God to you, go along with them, but also at the same time, and I, I just have to make this statement because I have seen this in the past where somebody uh, gets stubborn because they have a belief and so they won't receive anything from anyone and they'll use that excuse that no I don't need any man to teach me uh, it's the spirit of God that teaches me but it's interesting that they're being taught error because they're not sticking with the scriptures I had a gentleman a couple of weeks ago come in and boy he kept emphasizing I'm biblical I read the scriptures it's what the Bible says but everything he was saying was air he he dis, he uh, discounted the Trinity he discounted the church he discounted uh, the Bible he discounted the the Apocrypha as not as being canonical and not canonical and so there was a lot of errors there and yet he kept saying what I'm telling you is biblical it's in the scriptures study it and research it so use they use the same words so my question is so how do we really know what's true or not and that's the frustration, I think, with a lot of us. Um, we have to just read the word ourselves and ask the Lord to teach Amen. us and really come up with some principles. Because there's principles that you use to interpret the scriptures. For one, is that you need to be reading the context. So read the scripture over and over until you get the context of what is being said. For instance, in chapter 1, we have the introduction. So Paul introduces himself and then also prays for the church as his normal introduction is. So it's an introduction and we should take it that way. And in this introduction, he says some certain things about God and, and these things are true and we receive it that way. And so we observe the text, then we interpret the text, and then we apply the text. So let's go ahead and read uh, chapter one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother. So immediately he gives his credentials here, and rightly so in Second Corinthians because he's dealing with men who are coming into the church and claiming to be apostles. Now, we no longer have apostles in the sense of the New Testament when the church had started in the beginning. There were only 12 or 13 apostles if you count Mathis as an apostle, and that was it. After that, we were just messengers that were sent out. We were pastors, we were teachers, we were evangelists, uh, Anything other than that is man-made. So if someone today says they're an apostle, and I get it, uh, they're saying I'm a messenger of God, and so they're using the word apostle, but they're not an apostle in the sense of, of the New Testament, and God doesn't give new revelation. The revelation of God has been done from Genesis to Revelation. It's, it's done, it's over, there's not going to be new revelation, new doctrine, and so forth. So you have to be careful of those things. 
So he says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia. So he's writing to the saints, to the body of Christ, just as he's writing to us today. And he says, as he normally does, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace only comes from God our Father. You cannot find peace or grace in any other man or in any religious system. It only comes from our Father in heaven. I find that our human depravity and sinfulness sometimes doesn't understand the comfort of God because we have defined comfort in a different way than biblical comfort. Because our comfort is defined in a way that we feel, we touchy, we, we, we respond to that comfort. In other words, I feel comfortable. to get us through these things. We're finding the comfort along the way. So this is the God of all comfort. Now this is a true statement. Uh, it's not a lie. He's not the comfort at times. He's not a comfort to only certain people. He's a comfort at all for all. Who comforts us all or in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. <laughs> Young lady, I can't, her name is Marce, Michaela. Her name is Michaela, and she's uh, in her 20s, I believe, or 19. She's 19. She's going to school, but she's homeless. She's staying in her room at this moment, but they've been homeless. And she's sharing with me a little bit of her story. And I was, I was trying to comfort her in that God was in control. Uh, from my own experiences, learning that when life doesn't seem to be working out or when you're going through a trial or a struggle, uh, God somehow works it out. And in the end, you see that uh, take place and you're comforted by it. And so I was trying to comfort her uh, with that um, I don't know if she received it. She was so happy just being here. She was so happy hearing the message, the word. In fact, she was, she was saying, We're, we really want to be on the worship team. We, we really want to sing because it's so nice when you guys are all singing and we start singing and, oh, no, there's just something. It just brings such joy to our hearts, you know, and, and so it was really encouraging and comforting 
uh, to hear her say that. And, and the Lord was comforting her uh, through these things. So we comfort others by the comfort that we get from the Lord himself. Verse 5, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now the word consolation is another way of saying comfort. So <clears throat> as we suffer like Christ, if Christ suffered, we'll suffer. So as he's comforted, uh, we will also be comforted. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings, which we also suffer. So now Paul puts himself in this comforting situation and says, look, we suffer also. And if you're suffering and being afflicted, it's because of your comfort and your salvation. So somehow the afflictions are a part of the process of our comfort and our salvation. Now think about this for a second. How can you be comforted if you're not going through any affliction? There's no need to be comforted if there's no affliction. So, so there's comfort there in affliction, and so it works the same way. Comfort's there because there's affliction. Affliction's there, so there's comfort that comes along the way. Um, and we will all be afflicted but God somehow is working things out in our lives. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so also you will partake of the consolation. So what is his, what, what is his suggestion here or his hope? Just be steadfast. Just hang on. Hang on. I... I, I once in a while, I'll see that cat, you know, that's looking over the wall and his claws are on there and he's just like this. Just hang on, you know, just hang on. And sometimes it feels like you're hanging by a string, but just hang on. People, and it's not just one person. I've, I've been there and then there where you lose hope, where you get tired. I was talking to someone that was dealing, well, you know, like divorce. That's a hard thing. And then the battle over children. Uh, you're, you're battling over your children and you don't want the other party to, to win. There's resentment, there's bitterness, there's you know, all kinds of things going on. Uh, but after years and years and years and years of battling with court and law, then you're battling with lawyers because you have to pay for them. I mean, I've, I've seen it. And there's a point in your life where you're just going, I am just tired of this. I am just tired. I'm drained. I don't want to do this. And what you want to do is what? Just give up. And Paul would say, just get those claws and just hang in there. Just hang in there and pull yourself up. Um, we have to pull ourselves up by the power of Christ. We have to keep him in our minds and thoughts. We have to cry out to him for strength. Uh, we need to put him back into our lives and, and hang on. Um, the ones who give up, you know, sadly to say, it ends up getting worse. It gets worse. Uh, guys like Robin William, who just couldn't take it anymore, and he commits suicide. Uh, the pastor of, there in Ontario committing suicide, and then another pastor committing suicide because of just too much, and they end up giving up. Paul encourages us to stay fast. Then he goes on in verse A, for we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our troubles which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Does that sound like Paul's uh, happy? Does that sound like Paul's been comforted? Yeah. He says, we too have been there. I mean, we, we've gone to the point, guys, that we despaired of even life itself. We despaired it. I think when Paul said, <clears throat> absent from the body is present with the Lord and how he would rather go home to be with God, but yet it was for the advantage of the brethren that he stay, I think his heart was to go home with God. Yeah. I think that's what his heart was. <laughs> <clears throat> and I think anyone who is afflicted and suffering has that same mentality. I just want to go home. <laughs> I'm done. I hear people say, no, there's too much to do in this world. Now, I, I kind of question that. I'm like, what do you mean there's too much to do in this world? You mean having fun? You mean experiencing worldly things? I, it's not worth it. 
I had one guy, I, I remember saying to him, like, oh, I'm so ready to go. And this was like a couple of years after I got saved. And I was like, I'm ready to go home. And he says, I'm not. There's so many things I still want to experience in this world. So many fun things, so many exciting things. And I just scratched my head like, I don't get that. And shortly after, he ended up falling away, divorcing his wife and saying that Christianity uh, is no longer true in his own eyes. Wow. <clears throat> he had gone on a, he had felt that God had called him to be a pastor, <clears throat> I believe it was in Ojai. And when he came back, something happened over there and his, like his whole demeanor and belief system just crashed. He gave up. He gave up completely. And that's sad. <clears throat> we have to hang on, hang on to the Lord uh, Jesus Christ with everything that uh, we have. Paul says, we've despaired even to life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raised the dead. Uh, that Again, that's the point where you're in despair. <clears throat> You've got, you, you, you have nothing else to hold on to. So you're just like, God, you're the only thing that's going to be able to hold me here. You're the only one. And I can't even ask you to hold me because I'm tired of even asking you. It's that bad. I thank God that, that it's not our faith that keeps him faithful. Amen. <laughs> it's not our strength that, gives, that keeps him faithful to us. It's not our ability. It's not our righteousness. I don't know how many people I've talked to... <clears throat> that have said, you're a pastor, you need to be the example and be strong for everyone. That's a lot of burden on someone, isn't it? I go, I'm also a man and I'm human. And I'm being honest. I'm being honest. I saw this post this morning by a, a young couple. <clears throat> and it's, it, said, it said this, he's alive. And then it goes on. Now, we got ready to go to church. We argued before church. We took the wrong turn before church. We, and he, she just explained all these things that they did wrong. But we finally made it to church, and thank God it's by God's grace. You know? So in other words, we're not perfect. We're struggling. We're arguing before church. We didn't even want to go to church, but we made it to church by God's grace. They hung in there. Somehow God gave them the strength. That's the truth, right? Yeah. <clears throat> From my perspective... I would rather have a pastor that's honest and, you know, with him smiling up there and saying, everything's just hanky-dory, guys. Everything's like, if you just have faith in God, everything's going to be like my life. And when you look at his life, it's in shambles. Just like anyone else's life, dealing with the same afflictions, same sufferings, same abandonments, same struggles, same carnality, same narcissistic uh, issues that anyone else deals with. We're all sinners, and that's why we need Jesus more, Right? Amen. That's why we need to hang on to Jesus even more. So, <clears throat> you also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. For our boasting in this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincereness, sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you. For we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now, I trust you will understand even to the end, as also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast, as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And in this confidence, I intend to come to you before that you might have a second benefit to pass by way of you to Mesodania, to come again from Mesodania to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly or the things I plan? Do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be yes, yes and no, no. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. So he wasn't wishy-washy. Uh, he wanted to assure them that he had all intentions to visit them, and he did. And unfortunately, it didn't seem to help very much. And later on, I believe it was Titus that went back there and saw what was going on and, and gave a good report that they had changed some things that Paul uh, was uh, trying to correct. 
for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Salvanus, Timothy, uh, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes. In him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now, he who establishes us with you in Christ has and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a deposit. The Spirit in our hearts as a deposit. So Paul here is saying that his promises to them uh, was to be kept and it was God who is faithful to his promises and the sealing of us is the Holy Spirit that lives in us. He is our guarantee because he lives in us. A person that is born again has the Spirit of God in them and it's a guarantee uh, our spirits bear witness that someone else has the Spirit of God too. And so God has guaranteed us to be His children. We have, in a sense, been deposited into His family. And moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you, I came no more to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over uh, your faith, but as fellow workers for your joy and for my, by faith you stand. I like that about Paul. You know, he, he shared the truth, but he also realized that he can't change them. It wasn't him who could change them. It had to be the Holy Spirit that was in them that changed them. He can only share that truth. He didn't want them to feel like he's trying to um, dictate their life and govern their life. And that's so easy to do for us because when we're corrected, we feel like that person is trying to tell us what to do. And instead of taking the correction and trying to see if maybe what they're saying is true, uh, then, um, then taking it more as a, an insult and taking it as more as a, um, an accusation that you don't know what you're, you're doing. And that's easy for us to do because we don't like to be told what to do. We don't like to be corrected. But it's part of being a Christian, uh, being corrected by one another, uh, by those outside you. We should be able to, uh, to consider it. Oftentimes, uh, you can be corrected by somebody that you respect and honor, right? Because you respect them and they have some history with you. Uh, there's no motive that you have seen. And so it's easy to respect them. And that takes time to find someone like that. It takes a relationship. And then you get someone that maybe is under you that says something. And um, you kind of take it as though they're disrespecting you when the fact is they're not. It's interesting, as we were doing the barn door, me and Randy, um, it, we've, we've now been working since, what, uh, November together on this project in our church, me and him, every Saturday. You know, been here for sometimes eight hours a day, just working hand in hand with one another on all of these projects, whatever, whatever it is. And so we're communicating, we're, we're, we're describing our, our vision of what, we're doing at that moment and trying to piece it together and how it's working and so forth. And, you know, we have those moments where he says something and I'm like, no, that's not right. That's not going to work like that. And then I say something, and he goes, ah, I feel like, like you're, like you're your son telling me what to do, you know, <laughs> you know, and he'll say that out loud. I go, no, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm just trying to figure out how can we do this the best? He goes, no, I get that. But that's how I feel. I go, no, I, I get that. And we were putting that barn door together and those X's, think about it. How do you get that one board to just fit in there perfectly? And so he's sitting there, you know, with the board across it and he's like drawing a line underneath it, getting behind it. Then he got a piece of paper and he's drawing. And I'm looking, I go, Randy, that's not it. No, no, let me, let me, let me Randy, that's not it. And finally I put it down. Let me, give me, give me a square. Give me a square, Randy. Here. So I got the square, laid it across there, and I just drew a line this way, and then drew a line this way, and cut it there. He goes, cut it there, and cut it there, Randy, just cut it there. He cut it there, and it fit right. Now, let's do the other one, the square line, and all of a sudden, boop, it popped right in. He goes, oh, okay, that was easy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but we were struggling with that one thing. Probably took us a good <clears throat> half an hour trying to figure that out. And how, because we did some samples. Had some little pieces, and then when we lined them up, they were all off. And finally, I'm just like scratching my head. Lord, there's got to be an easier way here. It just doesn't make sense, you know? But we have those moments in our relationship. <clears throat> and we have grown together to realize 
and, and I'm sure that there's still more growth to happen, to realize that we're not trying to belittle the other one or say they can't do it. We're just trying to get the project done. I remember uh, the example that Chuck's, uh, that Romaine gave pertaining to Chuck Smith, where Chuck one day came down and said, Romaine, it was hot up there. What happened to the air conditioner? And Romaine said, I could have taken that in several different ways. I could have said, Chuck, you don't know what I've been doing. I've been running over here, running over there, doing this and that, you know, and started making all excuses, but that's not what Chuck wanted. What Chuck was saying is, Romaine, make sure the air's on next time. That was it, just plain and simple. He wasn't trying to accuse him, wasn't trying to say he wasn't doing his job. He just said, I need the air on. Whatever it takes to get the air on. <clears throat> and instead of taking things so personally, we need to say, you know, the air wasn't on, they probably would have enjoyed the air if it was on, you know? And we're trying to get this barn door and we're both trying to figure this out. We're not trying to tread on anyone's, you know, uh, um, worth or pride or anything. We're just trying to work through it. And that takes a time and process. Uh, it takes a lot of time and process. It takes a lot of being quiet and not saying anything and res not responding and taking it in and thinking about it. And these are things that I'm learning. I'm still trying to, to learn from them when people correct me. Um, <clears throat> I see things a certain way. People, Other people see things another way. And sometimes I see what they're saying. I go, do it. Go for it. Sometimes they'll ask me, let's do this. And I'll give them my thought. And they say, but what about this? I go, that sounds better. Do it. You know, I don't have a problem doing that. But it takes time. It takes work, and I think that's what uh, iron sharpening iron does. So you learn to work together. <clears throat> you know, doing this, the sanctuary, I knew that there would be people that don't like the color, that don't like the style. But you'll always have those people. There'll always be someone that doesn't like something. And you just learn to, to embrace that and say, that's fine. I understand you don't like it. And that's wonderful, but this is what I have decided to do. And whether you like it or not like it, this is what it is. And so you have to learn to just say, that's fine, too. And I can live with it. It's not that important that I have to throw a tantrum over it. But just trust in God, that God knows what he's doing. So anyway, Paul was dealing with relationships there in Corinth. So, And they're always difficult to maintain. God bless you guys. Thank you for watching our Devo 30 this morning. Hopefully we'll see you on Wednesday as we go through chapter two. Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we pray, Lord, that you would just uh, help us, Lord God, in these relationships that we have, Father, and help us, Lord God, to receive comfort from you and comfort from the situations so the afflictions that we go through, Lord, because they're producing something in our salvation, Father. They're bringing comfort to our our hearts and our souls, and we're receiving that comfort from you, which then builds upon that relationship we have in you because it solidifies the fact that you're real. And we know that you're a person and that you're able to comfort us in time of affliction, Lord. And that just, um, and that just makes our faith even more real. And no one can take that away from us because we have been comforted by God himself. And thank you for that. And I pray for my brothers and sisters as they go on their way, number their steps, and bless them today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. If you have any prayer requests, please post them or private message me. We're going to take some time and pray for you.